On November 21st, 1964, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, built by the Triborough Bridge Authority, was officially opened. To say what it's like to be uh, in a household where bridges are being built is a little difficult to explain. I think we all went on with our lives. My father certainly uh, did a lot of his homework at, uh, in the evening, late until the night. The one thing I can remember is that when he finished his work at his desk, he would carefully clean the desk, all his papers away, everything straight. And the final was when he closed the drawers of the desk. You would hear the, the, the closing sound and we knew Father's ready to come and talk to us. He was very, very fond of, of gardening and, and uh, proud of his vegetables. When Father was um, uh, working on design for the Verrazano Bridge, which he was doing at home, he showed it to my, or actually it was my stepmother, and she looked at it and she very tactfully said, uh, but you know, Othmar, you shouldn't repeat yourself. Uh, this looks more like the George Washington Bridge with, with the open work on it. Maybe it would be nice to make it modern with a, with a solid tower. And she sketched off in her uh, untrained way. And uh, Father looked at that, went back to the board, and came back with a sketch, which is uh, now the designs, which are the actual ones that were used for the tower. He always referred to the tower as, as, as hers. At the time of the opening of the bridge, the, all the uh, workers were given a, a medal. It came in a nice little box, and uh, Father had uh, put a note of the box. My fellow worker, he wrote on the uh, card. She was so pleased with the, with the medal that she had a, 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 a loop put on it and wore it as a medallion. Father's connection with uh, Moses uh, was over a period of more than 30 years. On and off, I think, uh, my, uh, Father and Moses worked, uh, the first was with the Triborough Bridge, and then, uh, of course, with the Verrazano Bridge, and also the um, uh, Throgsneck. I started out with the American Bridge Company on the Throgsneck Bridge. 1959, I was only 22 years old, and I stayed with the American Bridge Company and went to another job. We went to the Prospect Expressway, waiting to go to the Narrows Bridge. And uh, my job at that time then is I was, in, was called a walk boss, which meant that I was in charge of uh, one segment of the bridge from the uh, Brooklyn Tower uh, saddle, which is where the cable passes over the tower, down to the Brooklyn Anchorage to where the other end of the cable attaches to the eye bars and to where the spinning equipment is and there's a, an apparatus called a spinning wheel if you will which is uh, very very similar to a ski lift it just is a ski lift it's an endless cable and it starts from the anchorage and it goes up to the tower and it goes down across the river up to the next tower and down to the next backspan to the anchorage and at that point the wire is taken off of this uh, wheel and attached to the eye bars, which are the embedded deep into the concrete at the bottom of the anchorages. And this process takes place back and forth, back and forth, uh, day and night, for how long it takes to, uh, to get enough wire across to uh, create a cable. Oh, the steel is about this, that's about, uh, about 14 inches. And then up there, it looked like this about six inches, you know. <laughs> But there's no handrail, you know, and it's 690 feet up. And I walked over and my men came over behind me. The water's a long way down there, you know. At the way you're walking, you, you don't walk too fast, you, but you don't scuff along either. You, you know, you walk with a nice step, balances everything when you're up in the air like that. Working on a bridge is a lot different than working on a building or other work that iron workers do because 
Here on the, on the top of the tower at the Narrows Bridge is a fine space where there actually was two derricks sitting up on top of this tower and two full crews of men. And you're there day after day after day. It's not like, uh, you know, you're going to spend almost two years with these same group of guys in the same spot. To get along with other people, you had to make sure that you could. If you couldn't get along with everybody you're working with, then you had to leave, you had to get out of there. I didn't go to the Narrows until around uh, November year, so winter was already coming in. Uh, there was probably two of the coldest winters I ever spent in my life. The summer, you work in the blazing heat and the sun, and, and the iron gets hot, and, the, and the, it's tough work. My husband worked on it, and he used to come home every evening with those little blisters on his knees that I would have to try to break and cure. I used to say to the kids, Daddy is working over there. You didn't get help at that time from your husband like you get today because they work too hard all day. That's the way I felt about it. A couple of the Newfie iron workers got a little annoyed because somebody had said that the work was done by the Indians. But th these were Canadian Indians. My husband worked with quite a few of them. Montreal area, and I'm from a reservation on the St. Lawrence River. And that reservation is called Ganawage. I worked on the spinning of the cables and of the binding, binding of the cables. Well, I think I, I played an insignificant part in, in that bridge completion. I mean, I only played a small part in that, you know, so. This happens, the job is shut down for that day. Everybody go home, they come back, go to work the next day, and it's all, you have to forget about it because you have work to do, you know. I, you know, I'm from Newfoundland. So a lot of people from Newfoundland worked on those bridges. And I knew quite a few of the Indians. They were great fellows, hard workers. You take a chance. But the Newfoundlanders wasn't like that. They were more careful. But you know, you have to do your do regardless, you know. My cousin, uh, actually it was my father's cousin that uh, introduced me to uh, ironwork. He brought me here and I served my apprenticeship, you know, just carrying rivets and bolts. And my, my dad was an iron worker. In fact, the majority of men were structural steel workers. He never wanted me to get into this line of work. He thought it was a bit dangerous. It just wasn't a family uh, type of a life, you know. Uh, you were here and your wife and children were in Canada, so there was a separation there. He, he just didn't go for that type of thing, you know. You only got into one of these locals because you either had a father or a father-in-law or an uncle or a, a cousin. Somebody had to bring you down and introduce you and get you going and get you uh, in. You just didn't walk off the street and say, I, I want to be this. He brought you around and, and that's the way it was. In the years of the civil rights laws, the government uh, developed a whole new set of rules and regulations for uh, how unions recruit. We had to develop a test or an examination to become an apprentice. And then we had to advertise, and we had to advertise in every paper in the city. My father was an iron worker. All my father's friends were iron workers. That's all we talked about was iron work and not on jobs. I went out on jobs with him when I was still going to high school. I'd have a day off, he'd take me on a job with him, and I'd hang around, maybe go get the coffee for the guys or something. I was definitely mesmerized by uh, watching these guys put the steel up, and. Uh, it looked like something that I would want to do. You felt a certain amount of pride, and uh, I think that most of the workers that were there uh, felt the same way, that they were part of something big. The days were always uh, full of something new and something different. Just watching the ships come in and out of the harbor, and it was just an interesting place to work. Well, I think that's the greatest job I was ever on. Oh, yes, without a doubt, it was the greatest because it was high avoid enhancing. <laughs> they gave out these medals after the bridge was complete. I have a, um, a box with anything special, you know. I have a watch that my dad left me and I keep it in with there. I have a couple of rings, 
heirlooms, you know. Yeah, it's special. Yeah. Every time I cross it, I just say a little prayer for all the ones that helped to build it. And I look at all those bolts that are in, and I think, I wonder how many of them did my husband put in? Of course I use the branch <laughs> all the time, and I think it's so great. But every time I um, pass the 92nd Street exit, which is where our house stood, um, I become a little wistful. You know, people using that bridge and using that exit have no idea um, of the uh, impact that it had on the lives of those people who lived there. The Safe Bay Ridge Committee uh, initially, I'm sure, you know, they had some ideas of grandeur that they were going to be able to defeat this. Uh, they had all sorts of... Uh, but it was nothing holding it up. It was just a sight to see. And we used to walk around all the time by Shore Road just watching them build the bridge. Yeah. yeah it was great. Yeah. <laughs> My parents had been there for over 20 years. Um, the tenants upstairs had lived in the house for that length of time. We were a large, almost extended family, um, knew the neighbors. We weren't especially close to all of the neighbors, but close enough so that if we had remained on the block, you know, the connection um, would always be there. During World War II, my mother had a victory garden in the backyard. And so uh, over the years even, I remembered uh, lots of vegetables and fresh tomatoes. And um, so it was a wonderful uh, place to, uh, to grow up. Occasionally, my father would go to meetings uh, that were held in the community um, that were uh, protesting the bridge. The meetings were numerous. My uncle, uh, his name was Nick, Nicholas Sakenzi, he was very active in the community. He became involved in the Save Bay Ridge Committee. Walter Kassenbrock, I would, I would suspect that he was the actual founder. Another meeting that sticks most in my head, I always recall, was downtown Manhattan. It was very, very well attended. And uh, the position of Bay Ridge was being presented by the Save Bay Ridge Committee, and this was a meeting with the mayor, who I believe at the time was Mayor Wagner. And to my recollection, Moses was there at this meeting. And this was like, you know, like the final shot. And it was, you're following the wrong Moses. Well, the crowd went bananas. It went bananas, and the meeting came to a rather abrupt end. I recall my father saying that there was a lot of grandstanding by some of um, uh, the elected officials, and he really didn't think much could be done because he felt that the decision had already been made. Subsequently, he found out that the path proposed was going to affect only our side of the block. So it was devastating for us. The biggest Alton proposal was, why don't you just take it along the shore, along Shore Road? You already have a, uh, the Bell Parkway there. Most of the apartments along Shore Road were expensive apartments because of the view that you had. 7th Avenue were uh, one and two family homes, very common folk, right, the working class. So of course there were all sorts of accusations, they were protecting the property interests of those who were the wealthy, you know, they had all sorts of uh, uh, accusations against the, the, the people who were proposing this. There may have been some technical reasons why they couldn't have done it too. I, trying to picture it myself, I think it was kind of difficult to do because they would have to double deck it to take the type of uh, traffic. The type of traffic would have been horrendous. It had to be Shore Road. Or Families to, uh, to move and to leave Dahlgren Place and that was a very strange experience. Uh, walking down and passing um, the lots uh, where homes of my friends, you know, used to stand. The day that we did move, my sister and my father and my brother 
said that they were going to go back to Dahlgren Place and see what it's like. All the windows had been broken uh, by, by the local kids. And I was so glad that I hadn't gone because, you know, my heart would have been broken. I can recall the dirt. The people just such difficulty keeping the houses clean. I've often said that be able to stay in Bay Ridge and that, you know, we would have to accept the fact that we'd have to move into another neighborhood. So moving to Bensonhurst was very traumatic for us and difficult. So many of them moved out of the area, out of the area completely. A great many, you know, Bay Ridgeites, uh, now Staten Islands, because uh, there was a tremendous push after the bridge was up. You did see a, a movement, a pattern. Eventually inundated Staten Island. Naturally, you're a stranger to them and they made you feel, feel like a stranger. When you went into the stores, it was everything was like very like uh, cold. Very like, can I help you? Okay, next. When I lived in Brooklyn, when I, as I grew up in Brooklyn, um, the area in Bensonhurst in which I grew up was predominantly Italian. So you had your bakery where you walked in and your, the baker, the woman behind the counter would speak Italian or would speak English. You know, they knew you because you grew up in the neighborhood. They knew, they knew me as Rosie and Joe's daughter. You know, oh, there's Linda, there's Rosie and Joe's daughter. What do your parents want today? Where my second house was, it was more Irish. It just didn't have the population and the flavor that Bensonhurst had. It's funny because when my daughter was born, my oldest daughter, Lauren, I wanted to walk to the store, as you did in Brooklyn. You put the baby in the carriage, you walk to the store. And as I'm walking to the store, which was maybe about 10 blocks away, people passing in a car would stare at me. One elderly couple actually slowed down and did a double take and looked at me. I mean, I didn't think it was anything strange, you know. I walked to the supermarket, I got my loaf of bread, my container of milk, I put, you know, put the groceries on the bottom of the carriage, and I walked home. Later, I spoke with my neighbor and I said, why would people, you know, they were looking and staring at me. Just to me, oh, Linda, she's walking Staten Island. I work at a junior high school in Brooklyn. I know the commute sometimes can be a little hairy, but you know what? I like the school in which I'm in. It gives me that little touch of Brooklyn that I think I kind of still need. <laughs> the commuting is going to work. It takes about an hour. So I find myself back in my car with my car legs, going from Staten Island to Brooklyn, working, and then coming from Brooklyn back to Staten Island. And I commute an awful lot because my parents and my grandparents and my aunts are still in Brooklyn. I was only about four or five when the Verrazano Bridge was built. So um, I don't remember it being built. I think it's more a reflection of what people tell me about it and how it affected the neighborhood and how it impacted the community in, in a negative way. I live in a neighborhood where people are passing through or going to work or driving their drive. I walk or I take my bicycle or I take public transportation and I feel very strongly about that. If you look at Bay Ridge, it's totally encompassed by highways. You can just look at the map and you see it. it just, it's like choking us. The neighborhood became a way to get on and off of these highways and the only way to do that was to, to make these very ugly things in the middle of the neighborhood, these ugly exchanges and you know, dark corridors. And so it was very easy then at that point to say, well, this, the neighborhood is not so desirable anymore. So for me, it's kind of romantic to think back at the time when there was a ferry that could go to Staten Island. When you uh, live in Brooklyn, you go to Manhattan, you go to the Bronx, you go to Long Island, but you really didn't go to Staten Island because you had to go on the ferry. You know, it was nice to go on the ferry with, with your car. That was nice, but just to go there, you know, the bridge made a big difference. Oh, I, the Verrazano Bridge helped us in many ways. Commuting with Staten Island, New Jersey, didn't have to go through Manhattan, through the tunnels, or wait for the ferry. And uh, I wish they would build another one. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good thing to have, and he's right. We should have more bridges. Thus, the world's largest suspension bridge. When the bridge was up, my family was very excited. They're very much for them. It's, it's beautiful. Even though it's a beautiful bridge, there are ramifications in terms of construction and traffic and things like this. To me, the Golden Gate 
is minimal compared to the view of the, the Verrazano. The Verrazano is absolutely beautiful.